Welcome to the Maximal Institute Podcast. I'm Joseph Stewart. The Savior said, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you. How does the world giveth, give I unto you? Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. But over the past year and a half, I have to admit that I have been afraid. How can we find peace in our societies and be peacemakers as individuals? Patrick Mason of Utah State University and David Pulsifer of BYU-Idaho have written about just these topics in their new book in the Maxwell Institute's Living Faith series, Proclaim Peace, The Restoration's Answer to an Age of Conflict. We hope you enjoy this episode. Well, maybe enjoy is the wrong word. We want you to consider what they say and its implications for Latter-day Saints and the communities they live in. Could you please take a moment to review the Maxwell Institute podcast or recommend it to a friend? It makes a big difference in who we are able to reach. You can also follow us on Instagram at at BYU Maxwell. David, Patrick, welcome to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Thank you for the invitation. Great to be here. All right. So both of you are scholars. You both are professors. So how did you come to the field of peace and conflict studies? That's a great question. And I came about it in a rather roundabout way. I received my doctorate at the University of Minnesota, learned a lot about conflict, oppression, hegemony. And uh, in the midst of my studies, I wanted to learn more about alternative uh, theories about peace, about altruism, selflessness. And when I began asking my faculty about that, they they didn't know where to point me. Um, so it really wasn't until I started teaching at what was then Ricks College, now BYU-Idaho, uh, and teaching American history that I began to become fascinated first with the civil rights movement and in particular the way it paralleled with the anti-Nephi-Lehi's in the Book of Mormon. And that's kind of kind of got me launched, uh, realizing that there was the theories of love. There were the theories of peace right there in front of me the whole time, and I just hadn't seen it. Thanks, David. How about you, Patrick? For me, it actually started in a real way here on this campus at BYU. As a freshman, I took History of Civilization course by, I mean, it was team taught by Wilfred Griggs and Alan Keel. And the the theme of this course was the pen and the sword, how humans throughout history have sought for peace, but ended up in oftentimes in violent conflict. And this was, it was a brilliant eye-opening course for me in terms of, you know, we were reading all kinds of stuff and, and having just incredible discussions. So for me, that was very formative as a freshman. And I carried that with me as I went to graduate school at the University of Notre Dame. And I, I went to study history just, just like David did. But along the way, I encountered and, and met these students completely serendipitously who were in the master's program in international peace studies. I didn't know there was such a thing as peace studies. It took me a while to figure out what that was, but I was so impressed with these students uh, from all around the world, from all different religions and cultures who were there studying and dedicating their lives to peace. And I thought, I believe that too. <laughs> and, uh, and so I actually started to do some work. I uh, actually took a leave from my doctoral program to get the, the master's degree in peace studies. And then uh, David and I ran into each other and here we are. <laughs> well, we're certainly glad that you two met each other, a golden gopher and a golden domer coming together. <laughs> and I like to start with just thinking about what the terms we're going to use mean. So David, what is peace? How are you all discussing that in this book? Well, we're discussing it in some specific ways that are different from the way we often use it in Latter-day Saint discourse. In Latter-day Saint conversations in Sunday school, as we read the scriptures and we look at the word peace, often what we think about is inner peace, finding peace with God, finding peace within ourselves. And that, of course, is, is an, a key and crucial element of peace. But we're thinking about peace in particular in this book in a more expansive way. We're thinking about peace in terms of societal peace, largely. Uh, we deal a little bit with interpersonal peace as well, which is peace between individuals. But ultimately, we're looking at what does our theology have to say about peace on a broad scale? And there, peace scholars define peace in kind of two broad terms. One's called negative peace, which is the absence of direct conflict or what most people think of when they think of violence, people hitting each other, yelling at each other, armies invading other countries. Uh, the absence of that is what scholars call negative peace. But we're also very interested in the concept of positive peace, which is the absence of structural violence and cultural violence, which are at the kind of a deeper level, which I guess we'll, we can talk about uh, a little bit later on. But the absence of that or the presence of a society that is just and equitable and the, has the basic foundations for the best human flourishing, that's what we call positive peace. Or in Latter-day Saints speak, we call it Zion. And that's uh, those are the definitions we're dealing with most often in the book. 
Marvelous. Thank you. Patrick, how would you define violence as you and David are using it in the book? Well, like David said, I mean, a lot of aspects of violence are pretty apparent to people. I mean, people know it when they see it. And so certainly we're concerned with with direct violence and the need to alleviate or eliminate that. But as David said, there are other, these two other categories that the scholars have developed called structural violence and cultural violence, and, and they're equally important to consider. Structural violence uh, happens when the structures of our societies are arranged in such a way as to uh, limit people's abilities for thriving or for progress or that harm them in various ways. So we can think about unjust laws. We can think about unjust economic arrangements. So certainly, for instance, in, in the United States, Jim Crow laws that you know discriminated against African-Americans purely on the basis of their race. Uh, these were clear examples of structural violence, uh, apartheid in South Africa. We can think of lots of other examples. Cultural violence comes when it's not just in the structures of our societies, but in the kinds of attitudes and opinions and perspectives that people develop that justify or give license to either direct or structural violence. There was a, there's a great peace scholar named Johann Galtung that, that said when, when one man beats his wife, that's clearly a case of direct violence. When a million men beat their wives because of, because of misogyny, because of sexism, then you've got cultural violence. So cultural violence are, are the kinds of cultural ideas that we have are oftentimes around inequality or that one group is superior to another that, that justify or, or make people think that violence is, is somehow okay, that other kinds of violence are okay. So, so we believe that the restored gospel is equally concerned with all of these forms of violence because they all reinforce one another. They all feed one another. What we want to do and what the restored gospel does is introduce you know, these aspects of positive peace or Zion that help address and, and to stop uh, the downward spiral of these different kinds of violence and to reverse the cycle so that we get an upward spiral towards peace and towards Zion. Yeah, I like that both of your definitions really include questions of scale. It's not just right. individual peace or individuals refraining from violence, but it's all of us as a society, as a community, working together, as David said, and as we'll discuss later, to building up Zion. You show that Restoration Scripture emphasizes the communal and social aspects of building and keeping peace, as well as the individual need for peace. Could you give an example of what a communal or social striving for peace looks like? I think that we see that over and over again in Scripture. You see it in the Book of Mormon, especially 4th Nephi is the great example of the communal expression of peace, where every man did deal justly one with another, where they eliminate all forms of distinction between one another in terms of racial or ethnic or religious groups, where they begin to share their resources with one another in ways that provide for the greatest human flourishing. But we also see that it's not just in kind of ancient texts, we also see it in the Restoration's history. The entire project of Zion outlined in almost every single section of the Doctrine and Covenants to one degree or another is ultimately about a communal effort to create a society in which people are not uh, at at war with one another, and that's negative peace, and are also engaging in this project of creating the ideal society, place where the ultimate forms of human flourishing can occur. So I think as Latter-day Saints, we naturally have these terms of negative peace and positive peace, and especially positive peace in the form of Zion is just something that is right at the heart of what we're trying to accomplish. We're not merely trying to be another sectarian group, another religious organization. We're literally trying to build a society uh, to which Christ can return and that will have all the aspects of positive peace that, that we hope to, to achieve. Thank you for that. Your first chapter begins with Joseph Smith in Liberty Jail. What do you take away from his letter to the saints, especially concerning persuasion? Yeah, so before we launched in specifically into questions of violence and peace, we really wanted to establish the kind of theological basis for thinking about this. And sometimes I, I think we, we think that the power is bad, right? Oftentimes power takes on a negative connotation. But, but in fact, uh, power itself is, is neutral and can be used either for good or bad purposes. And God has power, right? Uh, and so 
So we wanted to think about what, what are the ways in which the universe is structured? What are the lessons that we draw from this? And, and for us, one of the most brilliant and insightful texts ever about the nature of God's character, the nature of God's power comes from Joseph Smith's letter to, from Liberty Jail. And, you know, and, and, and think about the context here where, where the Latter-day Saints, I mean, th this is easily the low point of Joseph Smith's life. I mean, that the saints have been driven from their homes. Uh, he very narrowly averts execution, doesn't know exactly what's happening. The Latter-day Saints are refugees being taken in uh, by the, the people of Quincy, Illinois. And Joseph has a lot of big questions. And part of the answer that comes to him uh, in this beautiful letter that we've now canonized parts of as sections 121, 122, and 123 of the Doctrine and Covenants is where God teaches a very powerful lesson about the nature of power. And, and this is a passage that's familiar to all Latter-day Saints, where it says, no power or influence can or ought to be maintained by virtue of the priesthood, only by persuasion, by long suffering, by gentleness and meekness, and by love unfeigned, by kindness and by pure knowledge, which shall greatly enlarge the soul without hypocrisy and without guile. You know, and oftentimes, uh, at least as, as I grew up and I heard this scripture a lot, I oftentimes heard it specifically in the context of the priesthood that we exercise within the church, like the Aaronic or the Melchizedek priesthood. And, and we ought to oftentimes focus on how we ought to be like nice to each other, right? Now, that's very important. We, we, we ought to be. But I, th I think one of the, the singular insights that comes from this verse is, is not only that no power or influence ought to be maintained this way, but no power influence can be maintained this way. And within the Latter-day Saint tradition, we understand priesthood not just to be like a collection of priests here on earth, but we understand priesthood to be the very power of God. And so what this verse indicates is that God himself, the power that the universe is predicated upon, cannot be maintained except through persuasion and through kindness and through love. So yes, certainly power can be and has been exercised with the opposite of all of that, with, with hate, with coercion, with manipulation. Certainly power can be exercised that way, but it can't be maintained, can't be maintained over the long run because we are all independent intelligences. We are, co we are eternal beings, co-eternal with God. And so the only forces that can maintain their influence over us over the long run are based on persuasion. They're based on our willingness to go along with them. And so this this singular insight that Joseph Smith has through Revelation while sitting in this dank, you know, prison cell, we think in, in a lot of ways it, it absolutely unlocks, you know, the, 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 the character and power of, of the way that the universe is organized. So moving from Missouri and Liberty Jail, you then move to the Middle East in the meridian of time where Jesus comes to a synagogue in the Gospel of Luke. And David, could you set the scene for us and then tell us what you and Patrick read from that event about the theology of peace? First, we probably need to recognize that we're borrowing here from a, a very influential scholar in this field named John Howard Yoder, who basically sets this up. And, and we found his insight to be quite profound and, and resonates well with Restoration Theology and Restoration Scripture, which is the idea that when Jesus comes to the synagogue and announces his messiahship, this is a fairly well-known moment in his ministry, right? He stands up in the synagogue, he opens the scroll, and he reads from Isaiah. When he reads, we hear often as him declaring himself as the great spiritual messiah. But what we sometimes miss is the way in which in declaring himself to be the spiritual messiah, he is also declaring himself to be the temporal messiah, the messiah of this world and of this world's institutions and organization. And he is declaring himself ultimately as the king of this kingdom. The kingdom of God is at hand. And that's not just a spiritual kingdom. It's a, an actual kingdom. And, and this is where John Howard Yoder does a wonderful reading of this. And as you listen to the words in that context, they take on a much deeper and ultimately kind of more comprehensive meaning than just I'm here to help people get past their spiritual challenges. We're here to actually also upend society and turn it into what we would call Zion. And so when, the, when he stands and says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind and let the oppressed go free to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And here, 
he's declaring a jubilee year, according to the law of Moses, in which all debts are forgiven, all slaves are freed. Society gets a kind of reboot in which everything's kind of leveled and we begin again. And all of the distinctions that have been created over the 50 years pr prior get reset. And those who have been in, in situations of oppression get relief. It's an upside down kingdom, as, as uh, scholars of the New Testament have talked about. It, it, it turns everything kind of on its head. And when Jesus says, I'm here to bring good news to the poor, he means literally the poor and to the captive, the captives, not just the poor in, in spirit or those captive by sin. He means those who are sitting in jails and people who need relief in their economic circumstances. So this becomes a much more, in many ways, radical text than we normally think of it. And when you add this with all of the revelations to Joseph Smith, you realize that, yeah, the, the kingdom is more than just spiritual relief. It's a reordering of society, and that's what Jesus is proclaiming. Yeah, and a lot of New Testament scholars have, have shown how that's exactly the way people would have heard it during Jesus's time. You remember, I think it's in the Gospel of John, where after he's given a sermon, the, the, the people come and literally want to seize him and make him king. He flees because the, the kind of king or kingdom that they have in mind is not what he has in mind. I mean, at every moment, Jesus is sort of confounding their and our expectations uh, all the way up until his interview with Pilate. And so Jesus is the, is the king of the kingdom of God, but it is, as David said, it's a different kind of kingdom. It's not predicated on the same kind of rules that earthly kingdoms have been set up by. And, and so his, not only his messianic ministry, but also his prophetic ministry is supposed to help us rethink the way that we relate to one another. Yes, individually, yes, interpersonally, but it's supposed to help us think about our politics, our economics, uh, and, and of course, the, the way that we do harm to, to one another. And so just revisiting the New Testament, and then we see this again in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants and Restoration Scripture, it always it, it challenges me to, to, to not become complacent in, in the kind of life that I live, the kinds of societies that we've created for ourselves. Now, in discussing the Savior and his atonement, you refer to it as a nonviolent atonement, which sticks out to me because there's a lot of blood, there's <laughs> yeah. swords, there's carrying a cross, there's all these symbols and physical manifestations of violence. So how can the atonement be nonviolent in this capacity? Yeah, it's a great question. And so, yes, yeah, certainly the atonement of Jesus Christ is associated with all kinds of brutality and suffering. And for us, one of the distinctive insights that we have as Latter-day Saints is that Jesus' atoning work for us occurs both on the cross, but also in the Garden of Gethsemane. I was in a dialogue group with, with other Christian scholars, and we were talking about our views of the atonement and, and the, the Latter-day Saints. We, we shared our understanding of Gethsemane. And for these other Christian scholars, they were blown away by this. They, I mean, these were New Testament experts, biblical scholars, theologians. They had never thought about the role of, the, of Gethsemane. And actually, they were deeply touched by this as we went to the passage in Luke, and then we went to passages in the Book of Mormon and the Doctrine and Covenants. It helped them more deeply appreciate the, the suffering and the atoning work of Jesus for us. And so I think we, we do have a distinctive insight on this as Latter-day Saints. But I think there's a, there's a kind of categorical distinction between what happens in Gethsemane and what happens on the cross. If you think about it in Gethsemane, Jesus went there voluntarily. He tells us he could have stopped it at any time, but, but he went there voluntarily because of his immense and infinite love for each of us. And there he voluntarily enters into our suffering, our pain, our sin as, as human beings. He does not go to the cross voluntarily in, in the sense that the cross was the ultimate symbol of the Roman Empire's brutality, the way that it ruled through force. Now, Jesus did choose to go to the cross. Actually, we have a lot of passages in the New Testament where he orients his ministry. He knows that's where he's going to end up. He's orienting himself to the cross, but, but nobody volunteers for the cross. Nobody raises their hand and says, yes, I'd like to be crucified. Thank you very much. It is the, the most devastating and torturous death that the Roman Empire could conceive of. If they could have come up with a better one or a worse one, they would have. And Jesus does this, and in so doing, he unmasks the brutality 
that the Roman Empire and every other empire has ever been built upon, that nobody deserves to be crucified, but especially not the innocent one, not the Messiah, not the sinless one, not the innocent lamb. And in allowing himself to be crucified, he unmasked, he exposed the brutality and the violence of that system. And we say that it's, it's, it's a great and eternal sacrifice, but also the last sacrifice. And G that's what Jesus intends. He intended for us to look at that and see what happens when we allow the logic of violence to play out in such a way that we will crucify our God. And so when we look at the cross, each one of us should say, no more, never again. This is where violence takes us. And so it's on the cross that he reveals the brutality of Caesar and all the Caesars throughout history, but also announces and initiates a new kind of kingdom and says, no, a new kingdom I give you, you know, a new way of being. He, he, he wants his disciples to, to instantiate. So the cross go, both becomes a great prophetic no, but also a great messianic yes uh, to a new kind of kingdom. And I think the, one of the profound elements of that kingdom is a kingdom as we often talk about is a disciple leadership, or in this case, a willingness to absorb the violence of the world instead of inflicting the violence. And in absorbing the violence, Jesus unlocks a new way of power and influence. This goes back to this idea that power and influence is maintained by persuasion, long suffering, gentleness, goodness, love, unfeigned, all of which is demonstrated by going to the cross. It's Christ's suffering that draws us to him. It's his willingness to take all of this on our behalf and to absorb the violence of the, the world that gives him greater influence than Caesar ever could have imagined having. I mean, we're 2,000 years later, and how many people are disciples are trying to recreate the, 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 the world of Caesar? Caesar's influence is long past. Christ continues, his influence continues to endure and, and to simply spread. And so the power of the king comes not in the normal ways that kings exercise power, where they lord over others. And this is something Christ is constantly reminding his disciples as he's moving towards the cross. This is not the kind of kingdom calling down fire from heaven, sitting on the thrones, all the things that you think of that are related to power and influence in this world are very different from the kingdom of God. I'm going to show you real power, real influence. And the cross becomes the emblem or the, the ultimate example of that path. And when he says, take up the cross and follow me, there's, there's a, as Elder Holland reminded us, that's a symbol that every one of us needs to pass through. But in part, it's, a, it's also a demonstration of the way to true enduring influence in the world and in the universe. This is the Max Wellness 2 podcast. We are discussing Proclaim Peace, the Restoration's Answer to an Age of Conflict by Patrick Mason and David Pulsifer. After discussing the Savior's ministry in the Gospel of Luke, you then turn to the Book of Mormon and Nephi slang Laban. And I was struck by the idea that you say that Nephi likely wrote his account decades after his encounter with Laban. Why do you think that's significant? It's important to remember that Nephi's record is actually his second time writing this down. He's, he's been through it one time, it's a way of trying to make sense of what's happening. It's, I think the second time through is not just so that uh, Martin, there's a kind of a, an escape clause for Martin Harris and is losing the 116 pages. I think there's also something in there for Nephi, that Nephi is trying to understand and make sense of a, a, a life that has been full of conflict and also a life in which he's been drawn to the word and drawn to, to God. And, and he just, most of second Nephi just relating and explaining the, the word of God as he found it and searched it and, and tried to kind of inhabit it in his own life that were on the plates of brass. And so you have this really interesting tension that I think comes because he's writing later and trying to make sense of of his life between the experience of wielding a sword, which is what he does in the case of Laban in a very, in a very graphic way, uh, a, a sword that he's clearly enamored with. He, he talks to, even years later of its kind of exquisite workmanship, right? And it's precious steel. That's a very kind of a, appealing path for him in, in some ways. And of course, he's had a lot of conflict with his brothers. And, and, and if you read it in t terms of this conflict between this impulse and the impulse for the word, 
which is he carries both of those emblems back into the desert. He, he takes the word and he takes the sword. And if you if we read kind of the, re the rest of his story, you can see this tension between wanting to kind of slap his brothers around and say, would you guys just get with the program? Um, and then moments when he is approaching them with greater kind of humility, a certain love unfeigned uh, in the, the language of Doctrine and Covenants 121, in which he seems to have greater influence over his brothers in those moments. And I think understanding that dynamic it kind of comes to a head almost in 2 Nephi 4, where it's like he realizes in the second accounting of his life, years after it, how his own temptation to be angry with his enemy, which the only enemies he has are his brothers, has been one of his great challenges in life. And yet, that wonderful line, I know in him I have trusted, he's, he, he's, he turns more and more and more to the word over the course of his writing. And you can watch this play out in his mind almost as he writes this retrospective account of his life. Now, I'm really interested in the idea, too, that you discuss that conflict does not equal violence. Uh, maybe this is just growing up in a family as the third of six kids, but often conflict <laughs> did equal violence that way. But you also discuss two different kinds of conflict. So what do you mean by creative conflict and what do you mean by destructive conflict? Yeah, so I'm the third child too, so we'll have to compare notes uh, uh, sometime. I was but, an oldest child, so I was the one inflicting, <laughs> inflicting the, the, the conflict. That, that, that's why you've come to peace uh, uh, later in life. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a form of atonement for, for, for my or sins. A true Cincinnati. Yes, yes, right? that's right. <laughs> well, you know, Latter day Saints are wonderful at many things. Uh, one of the things we are wonderful at is conflict avoidance. We have internalized a reading of Third Nephi 11. Remember when the Savior comes to the people, uh, one of the very first things he tells them is that contention is of the devil, right? And that they should not contend with one another with anger. Uh, so this, you know, this is a chapter that missionaries have read with uh, investigators a lot. This is a chapter that we teach a lot in church. So we've internalized this. Unfortunately, we've internalized the wrong lesson here. That what the Savior was specifically teaching was not the conflict is of the devil, but the contention is of the devil. And in fact, the Savior gives us the definition and what's the distinction between conflict and contention. He says it's because of the anger that we have with one another. So conflict is actually built into the very structures of the universe. If we go back to Genesis 1, to creation, the creation accounts, it's all about conflicts. The reason we have anything is there's a difference between land and water. There's a difference between night and day. There's a difference between male and female. So God creates difference and God creates conflict. You actually can't have anything without difference. Lehi teaches the same thing in 2 Nephi 2, an opposition in all things. So the conflict itself is baked into creation. And it's actually, uh, you, you think about the relationship between these pairings, between these differences, that's what brings beauty and goodness into the world. You know, the way that a night and day, the, 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 the boundary between them is, is a sunrise or a sunset, you know, some of the most beautiful things we have to see. So, so there can be this kind of beautiful, creative tension between these opposites or between these differences. And so there's a way to engage conflict lovingly, productively, constructively. There's a way to engage that conflict, that difference in anger intention, jealousy, with malice uh, towards one another, a spirit of vengeance. That is what the Savior is warning us against. So, so actually, one of the things that we really hope readers get, take away from this book, is that, again, conflict in and of itself is, is not bad, just like power in and of itself is, is not bad. It's how we use these things. And the Savior is always inviting us to engage these things constructively with love. Uh, difference is is inherent. Anybody in any relationship, whether it's a marriage relationship, a friendship, you know, anything, there is tension there. How do we engage that tension? How do we engage that conflict? And in fact, there are some tools, and these tools are given to us in the scriptures. And so, so that's what we try to do is kind of lift out these tools so the people in their own personal lives, but then it, it does scale up to societies. Uh, the, the same principles uh, apply. So there is a way to engage conflicts creatively, lovingly, constructively, not in the spirit of anger. Now, when you discuss love, it's not just sort of this ethereal or airy sort of thing. You call it assertive love. What does it mean for love to be assertive? It means that love sometimes is confrontational. It means that you're not just sitting back 
and waiting for things to happen. You're actually going out there and asserting one's love into the situation. For me, the, the greatest example of this, aside from the obvious preempt ultimate example of Jesus Christ, is the anti Nephi Lehi's. One of the things we often miss in their story, artists have focused on them throwing their weapons away, and that's a wonderful moment. But in fact, what happens next is extraordinary. They don't sit in their homes, cowering and waiting to be massacred by their enemies. They go out and meet them on the battlefield. This is a confrontational moment where they assert themselves without weapons in a spirit of prayer and clearly in a spirit of deep love for these people they call their brethren. They basically place themselves as a shield almost between their community and their attackers. And as their attackers come in and begin to assault them and, and to kill them, they're touched by this expression of love, this expression of faith, and they end up protecting their families in the process. So when we talk about assertive love, we're talking about love that that's active. It's not passive. It's going out and confronting evil, even aggression, and in as in this case, even something that was extraordinarily dangerous in which many of them lost their lives. And in the process, they transform the conflict. They transform it from something that was initially very destructive into something that was ultimately beautiful and redeeming as they themselves, those who lose their lives, Mormon says they go to God. And then all of these attackers who then throw down their weapons and come to God. Everybody was coming to God that day, or at least all the movement that day was, if anybody was going any direction, it was all towards God. And they transformed this into something horrific, but also something really beautiful in terms of transforming the conflict into a redemptive moment. When you're saying that, I immediately think about divine violence in scripture. So not just restoration scripture, but also in the, the Bible. So how do we think about events like the flood? or the walls at Jericho, or the poor guy who was just trying to keep the Ark of the Covenant steady as it was moving. <laughs> what do we do there in thinking about divine violence? Yeah, it's, it's a great question. And one of the things we wanted to do in the book was not avoid hard questions. Uh, so we didn't want to engage in the art of conflict avoidance. Uh, we, we wanted to think about, we wanted to take scripture holistically, not just the parts that, that we inherently like. And so absolutely, any reader of scripture, whether it be biblical scripture or restoration scripture, you've, you've got to take into account the, all these accounts, divine violence, either where God seems to be doing the violence himself or directing other people to do it. A lot of biblical scholars have worked with this a, a, a long time to make sense of what's going on in the Old and New Testaments. We focused especially our analysis and, uh, on restoration scripture. And, and I actually think that restoration scripture distills this challenge or conundrum into its most potent form in 3 Nephi 8 and 9, where prior to Jesus's resurrection and appearance to the people, to the Lehites, uh, there's massive destruction. And in 3 Nephi 9, I mean, whole cities burned and buried and drowned. And in 3 Nephi 9, the voice of Jesus says, I did this, I did this, I did this. I mean, it, it takes the problem of divine violence and it just distills it to its absolute purest essence. And, and we have to grapple with it. And the way that we think about this, the way that we think Restoration Scripture points us to is in the Book of Mormon's own theology, where it makes a distinction between the condescended God, who is Jesus Christ in the flesh, that Jesus came as the Son of God, took on flesh, and showed us how to live. What manner of men ought you to be, even as I am? We are pointed to, you know, follow the works, you know, the works that you see me do, that, that you should do also, 3 Nephi 27. We are pointed to the example of the condescended God. That is the example uh, for each of us as mortals, our limited perspective, our limited power, all the limitations that we have. Jesus points us to the way of nonviolence. Now, God in his heaven, the ascended God, uh, if we want to put it that way, God has much greater perspective. He has, he has a, a greater knowledge of the way things really are. He also has the power of resurrection. One of the reasons why there's a commandment, thou shalt not kill, is we can't make that right. God gives life. God takes life. God has the power to do this. And God promises resurrection for all of his children. And, and one of the things the Restoration Scripture shows is that God is, is in those moments. He does not distance himself 
even in those moments, and that God mourns even in those moments of destruction. Uh, we see this most powerfully in Moses 7 with the God who weeps, but we see it in 3 Nephi 9 as well. It's the devil who laughs. God mourns uh, even in the midst of this destruction. So ours is a God who destroys as well as creates, but whenever he talks about himself, he talks about he's a God of light and life and love. Those seems to be the part of the job description that he really relishes. Uh, you know, to, uh, and, and, and so, but I, I, I think any reader of scripture has to grapple with this. We, we come up with our own framework of how to do this. Other people have, have, have done it differently, but fundamentally we know that God is a God of love. God reveals himself as a God of love and Jesus in the flesh is, is a God who points us to a way of, of love and nonviolence as human beings. And ultimately we have powerful statements in the book of Mormon elsewhere that vengeance is mine and I will repay, and uh, in, not to you. This is, God can do it perfectly because he can remain ultimately connected and, and stays in that moment with his children in a way we are incapable of doing. And, and as Patrick said, he can, he can make it right in ways we can't. So there is no license of divine violence. When he says, because what manner of men ought you be even as I am, he's not talking about that ascended character. He's only talking about the condescended expression of God. Now, in thinking about the positive piece of Zion, as you all have discussed, you close out the book by discussing what you call just ward theory, which is the clever play on ideas of Christian ethics and theology of just war, when war is justified. So what do you all mean by just ward theory? Well, for us, it's the, the fact that peace building always happens in community. Of course, individuals can do it, but, but we, we know that this is the same way that we gather together in churches. There's a kind of scaling that happens. There's a kind of power that happens in community that, that you simply can't get just one-on-one. -on -one. And so we absolutely believe, I mean, most of this book is scriptural theology. Most of it is laying out these kinds of principles that are very important, uh, all of which have application. But, but we do want to think about what does this mean for an average Latter-day Saint? And so certainly we encourage individuals to go out and be anxiously engaged, right? What, what, to, to assess whatever needs their communities have, to feel the spirit work upon them in a sense of vocation. What am I called to do? What does God want me to do to, to, to make the world a better place? So go do that. But then we are also called into communities and, and our wards, I, I think one of the great witnesses of the work to the world that Latter-day Saints have is the power of community. In, in a world, especially in North America and Europe, where community is just disintegrating before our very eyes, wards are the places where we learn to love, where we learn to forgive, where we learn to show grace, where we also learn that, that strength in numbers, we can do more together than we could do apart. And so already there is so much goodness that happens among the Latter-day Saints. Uh, think about our humanitarian efforts. Think about our efforts in terms of refugee assistance, both at the general level, but at the local level. Think about the, the, the way that we take care of one another uh, in all kinds of, of wards are also places of conflict resolution. They can be a place that create conflict, but they give us practice in, in managing and hopefully transforming those conflicts. That's actually one of the reasons why God puts us in, in wards and in congregations, uh, I'm convinced. And we use the ward as a shorthand for all of the different structures of the church. Missions. I mean, think about the ways that missionaries go out and they give a certain number of hours towards community service. Think about if we were more intentional about this. Think about the ways, the powerful ways that missionaries could have a transformative uh, in terms of alleviating suffering and doing the work of peace building in whatever communities they're called to. So there are so many things. I mean, the, the, the BYU campuses are preparing not just people to go out and, and have you know, successful careers, but we hope that they're making peace builders because that's what it means to be a Christian. We hope, and, and this is what David's doing at BYU-Idaho. This is what Chad Ford is doing at BYU-Hawaii. This is what the Center for Peace and Conflict Resolution is doing here at BYU-Provo, that all of these structures that we have in the church are helping us be better peace builders, helping us be the peacemakers that, that Christ calls us to be. So that's what we mean by just war theory is to think about the ways that we can mobilize the structures of the church to, to go out and, and do good and build peace. Now, to close us out, following the injunction in Doctrine and Covenants section 88 to learn out of the best books, what are three of your best books, so three from each of you, that you would recommend to the Maxwell Institute podcast audience? 
Well, of course, uh, all of the books in the Living Faith series from the Maxwell Institute, that, that goes without saying. But if, if, if we want to go outside the family, uh, there are so many best books out there. Uh, so, so just three for me. One of the most transformative things I ever read, uh, it actually in a lot of ways changed the entire course of my thinking and my life, was the, autobi the autobiography of Malcolm X. And I read it as a teenager. I had no experience with the world that he was talking about, the kind of injustices uh, that, that he had to face as a black man in, in 20th century America. And I don't always agree with, uh, with everything in that book, but it opened my eyes to a different kind of world and his, his passion for justice and his uh, quest for truth absolutely resonated with me then. And, and now it's a book I've, I've assigned and taught lots of different times. On the other side of the coin, actually, his contemporary Martin Luther King, his book, Why We Can't Wait, which, is, which documents the civil rights freedom struggle in Birmingham, Alabama in 1963. It contains his famous letter from a Birmingham jail, which I think is one of the great pieces of writing uh, ever in, in the United States. And so that's a hugely inspirational book. And then for me, on the more explicitly religious side, actually, both of those books are very religious. But, but then also for me, Dietrich Bonhoeffer's book, uh, Discipleship, or sometimes it's called The Cost of Discipleship, it, uh, especially his opening chapters. I mean, he dives into an analysis and reading of the Sermon on the Mount, which just bowled me over. First time I read it and every time ever since made me take seriously the teachings of Jesus. And I fall very, very short. And so when I need a little juice, uh, I, I go to the Sermon on the Mount. When I need some, some extra juice to help me appreciate the, the prophetic power of the Sermon on the Mount, I, I go back to Bonhoeffer. I've been transformed by so many different books in, in, over the course of my life. As I kind of was thinking about this, I thought maybe it would be helpful to give at least a couple of in, really easy and accessible introductions to some of the theories that, or people that we kind of owe a debt to you in terms of the um, this particular book. So I thought about a very small, but for me was a kind of transformal, transformational book about nonviolence called Jesus and Nonviolence, A Third Way by a great Methodist theologian named Walter Wink, in which he lays out kind of some really just essential principles and how to see the life of Jesus in some very different ways and the way he calls us to, the, to a life of nonviolence. I used to have my students read that as well. And it was a, it's a powerful, short, punchy little book. Um, another one that I've really loved in terms of seeing scripture and in, in new ways and in new interpretation, and again, and one that I think is quite accessible, it's a book called Nonviolence, The Revolutionary Way of Jesus by a scholar, an evangelical theologian this time uh, named Preston Sprinkle. And uh, he's, uh, I've engaged in, uh, actually gotten to know him personally. And he's just a fascinating, interesting, and wonderful thinker who also writes in, in ways that uh, are very kind of conversational. And he's drawing on a lot of other scholars, ones we've mentioned here, like John Howard Yoder and others to, for his analysis. But uh, Yoder's hard to read, so I, I very rarely recommend Yoder because uh, he can be quite challenging. I uh, like Yoder. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I love Yoder. I mean, Loder, uh, Yoder just completely changed my way of reading the New Testament. And, and maybe that's the uh, third book to to recommend the politics of Jesus, which kind of a provocative title. He does a reading of Luke in particular, which does uh, demonstrate a, the ways in which Jesus's message is not just spiritual, but also socioeconomic, political, and an engaging and, and transform, transformational way of, of reading the New Testament. So I know we're wrapping up here, but, but, but I, um... Uh, uh, you know, I hope listeners can can get a sense that David and I, you know, we we have been deeply formed by reading books and insights uh, from people outside the Restoration tradition. They've helped us see things and understand things because, frankly, a lot of these other traditions have been added a lot longer than than our tradition and our church has been. So we've learned a lot from them, and they've helped us to go back and discover the beauty hiding in plain sight in our own restoration scripture. We want this book and, and we want the restoration's witness of peace to work upon the Latter-day Saints, but we also feel like the restoration has something to say to the rest of the world. So just like we've learned from fellow Christians and from Muslims and from Hindus and from secularists and from others about following the way of peace, we hope that Latter-day Saints join in that chorus and can be known as a people of peace uh, so that sometime on some podcast down the road, somebody's going to, some Hindu scholar is going to say, I read the Book of Mormon. 
And that helped me be a better peacemaker. If I could just add a second witness to that. I've discovered in our com my conversations with people of other faiths that when I share with them the story of the anti-Nephite Lehi's, they are just blown away by that story. They say, that is remarkable. I, I know of nothing like that in any of the other sacred texts that I study. And you need to get that out to the world. And so this is in part a chance to get that story along with all of the other extraordinarily rich resources within our own tradition, not just the Latter-day Saints, but yes, to the broader world as well. Thank you, Patrick. Thank you, David, for stopping by the Maxwell Institute podcast. Our pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to the Maxwell Institute podcast. Could you do us a favor and recommend this show to others? Review and rate the podcast in Apple Podcasts or other podcast providers or share the episode on social media. Thanks so much and have a blessed week, y'all.